you are streaming live. All right. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon. Welcome, everybody, to this uh, full house. I'm, uh, I'm impressed. I wish I got a, such a full house every uh, every other week. Uh, it's a pleasure to have here today uh, Dr. Lawrence Kern uh, from Duke University. Dr. Kern got his uh, degrees, BS, MS, and PhD from the University of Maryland. And uh, in 1989 and 1995, he joined the EE department, ECE department at Duke University, where he's a, currently a professor, of course. He was also a, chair, uh, a, cha a chairman before, uh, until 2014, when he was uh, named Vice Provost for Research at uh, Duke University. He, uh, prior to that, he held uh, the uh, younger professorship uh, at Duke University from 2003 to 2013. Uh, he's also a founder of Signal Innovation Group, uh, which was recently uh, acquired by BAE Systems, so I guess you're a millionaire now. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's an IEEE fellow, and uh, Larry, Dr. Karen is actually very well known in uh, the whole area of uh, information sciences and signal processing. It's a great pleasure to have him here. And uh, Larry, <laughs> the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, Hamid, and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so, um, uh, so you know what what I do as a professor, I, uh, the faculty members will understand this. During when during the academic year, um, it's very hard to get a whole lot of thinking done, and, and particularly now uh, that I'm a vice provost, it's very hard to get thinking done. And so what I try to do is um, during the summer months, for three or four months, I I try to really think hard about something, and I try to get enough momentum such that it can push me through the academic year. And um, so this, this summer, it was deep learning. So um, uh, it's been around for a little while, um, but um, I, I hadn't had time to really think about it deeply. Um, and, um, and so I, I decided that I was going to do that this summer. And, and so I also um, tend to um, be, I, I think, like a, an applied mathematic, uh, mathematician and statistician. I, I like to understand things. Um, from a fundamental perspective. And, and much of the deep learning work, while very good, is not necessarily grounded and <coughs> well grounded, necessarily. And so, um, so what I wanted to do was first um, to understand it, understand what, and, and the other problem with deep learning is, is that if you read the literature, there's a small group and they all speak the same language and it's their own language. And there's, there's a lot of jargon and it's, it's very difficult actually to jump in. And so what I wanted to do was to try to re, redo, come up with what they were doing and understand what they were doing from the standpoint of principled statistics and mathematics. And, and so um, uh, I think we've done that. And so. Um, um, so now, in my group, it's, it's a major focus of what we're doing. We have many different um, avenues of work in this area. So um, the point of this talk is simply to um, hopefully introduce what this thing called deep learning is and, and language that an engineer, statistician, mathematician can understand. And um, I actually think that the, the deep learning literature, the people who have done the work are brilliant. I'm not sure they're the best writers in the world, and it is, it is very difficult to follow what they're doing. And um, so I, I think I, I've spent many, many months thinking about this, and I think we understand it. So um, there are a lot here, I don't, so don't be afraid, because I'm not sure how far we're going to get through this. Um, there's a lot to deep learning, and um, rather than try to cover too much and communicate nothing, I'd rather discuss a few things and communicate a lot and then you can go and read yourself. But at least it'll give you a starting point. So there's a lot here and we'll see how far we go. This is actually, um, putting these slides together was, was an exercise for me to think about it and how I wanted to, how I think about it. And um, so it's kind of like a core dump of everything we're doing on deep learning today. Um, uh, and, and so I'm not sure, this is the first time I've actually given the talk publicly. And um, so I don't know how, we'll, you know, we'll see how far we get. 
Okay, but but I'll, I could share slides if we don't get that far. Okay, there, there's um, there are kind of two threads to deep learning. Um, so one thread of deep learning, and, and the two threads are actually around people. Um, so there's a guy named Jeff Hinton, a brilliant guy who uh, is at University of Toronto, also now at Google, and um, he he's from the 90s and then into the 2000s, early 2000s, has been talking about this thing called a restricted Boltzmann machine. And if, if you've been paying attention at all, you kind of maybe heard that word or that term, right? And then there was um, work related to that, which was the sigmoid belief network. And the literature, I think, is horrifically bad. Like, it's terribly written. And, but yet, they understand it, and, the, and I think they're like five people that review all the papers, and they're talking to themselves. And, but, um, so what I'm going to show you is how you can understand these things from a really fundamental statistical perspective, which I think is really nice because it shows that these guys really were brilliant, they, but they didn't necessarily convey it. Sometimes the most brilliant are not the best at explaining. Um, and so I'm going to try to explain that. So that's, that's um, kind of like, the, I would say, the Toronto thread of deep learning. And, and there's, a, there's a, at the university, the, the computer science department at the University of Toronto, there's a major focus, of course, on deep learning. And Google is very much in that. There's another, there's another thread. And so Hamid mentioned that, that uh, um, Jan LeCun was here a couple of years ago. And this, this is um, convolutional neural networks. And... Um, this is work that Jan LeCun developed, and this was in the, in the late 90s, very late 90s, in, uh, sorry, the late 80s and early 90s. And this is um, the Facebook thread, if you will, right? So Jan is now working for Facebook. So, to, you know, to me, when Google and Facebook are putting real money on the table to, to do stuff, it probably works, and it's probably worth paying attention to. And so that was why my summer was about deep learning. Um, but I, I, think, um, I think we understand it in a way that might be helpful, to, hopefully, to you. Okay, so, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, and then for those of you who know machine learning, I'm a machine learning person. Um, topic modeling is a big part of machine learning, document analysis. And um, so we've applied this to deep topic modeling. This is, this is new work. Almost everything I'm going to show you is new. Um, some of it published, but much of it in, will be soon published, but very new stuff. But um, I want to try to, for those of you who do machine learning and statistics, to show you how these methods can be applied in ways that a statistician or an engineer would understand. Okay, so, um, all right, so, um, so what's deep learning about and what's the motivation? So whenever data is coming in, be it imagery or audio or, te or text, um, the, the, the way in which we represent the data, so-called the features of the data, are, are, um, are likely to be very important for the inference task. But, but typically, oftentimes, the feature extraction is performed kind of separately, offline, with handcrafted features. And this is true in imagery and, uh, you know, vi um, this is true in images, it's true in video, and it's true in audio. So that very smart people over the years, without the computing that we have available today, which is what's made deep learning possible, um, they, they've crafted some really clever features for both images and audio. And, and that's also driven by industry, the fact that those are very important media, audio and visual. But there are many other types of data for which we don't have handcrafted features. And how do we, how do we find those features? And, and one would expect that the features that you extract will have a big impact on the inference. And so therefore, it, it makes sense, I think, and this is what deep learning is about, is that when we're learning a model of data that we want to try to characterize, the data representation <coughs> should ideally be learned along with learning the model. In fact, the representation is part of the model. And so um, there's been much recent success on learning deep feature representations. 
And in fact, this is motivated, at least it was originally mo motivated, by the way the mammalian brain appears to operate. In the, early, in the late 80s, they had the audacity to say they were trying to build a brain or, or um, model the brain or be motivated by the brain. People are much more humble today, and they don't make those claims, and that's to their they're very wise not to, because we understand very little about the brain. But um, based upon um, studying of stroke, stroke victims, there's a, there's a lot to be said that the representation of, of our, say, visual system is a deep architecture, a multi-scale architecture. And I'm going to show you some results that, um, that, uh, that are going to look like that. Um, so, and, 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 and moreover, they have some biological meaning. Okay, so what I want to do is I, I want to approach the deep learning problem from a framework that should be familiar to most statisticians and, and machine learning people. And then, and then we're going to move away from it. But at least I want to start on a, on a plane that we understand. <coughs> so let's take an image, a castle like this, and let's um, uh, take that, um, that, that image, or any image of course, and break it up into a bunch of patches. And this is, this is um, what is oftentimes done, uh, in fact, is almost always done. We, we take patches of data, we'll call the ith patch I, x sub i, and we have a total of n patches, and, and I'm going to consider all overlapping patches. So, in fact, I have a massive amount of data. Just from one image, I have a, a massive n. So I've got a lot of data. And so one of the things that, so, you know, deep learning, why is it happening now? It's happening because we have a lot of data and we have a lot of computational horsepower. And if you bring those together, you can do a lot. You can learn representations. Instead of having handcrafted features, we can learn the representation. Okay, so let's, let's um, assume we have xi, which are the ith one is the ith of these patches. It's just the RGB pixels, okay? And what we're going to do is try to learn a representation. So, uh, you know, I, I assume I, uh, this is a very technical crowd, so I, I, I'm going to be technical. Um, so uh, the, the, the ith um, patch is going to be just an unwrapped p-dimensional for p-pixels vector, okay? And in fact, it's going to be RGB, so I, I'm going to unwrap these. And then, so typically we use 8x8 eight eight, um, physical pixel, you know, size. And then RGB, 3. So 192, very typical, but it doesn't have to be. We can do this for hyperspectral and have done as well, ha have done that as well. So, so um, Xi is the ith patch of pixels. Um, D is a P by K dictionary, D dictionary. And the columns of D are going to be used to represent xi, and, and, and wi is a k-dimensional vector which represents the strength with which each of the dictionary elements, or each of the columns of D, are used to represent xi. And then epsilon i is some residual or noise. It's whatever is not captured by the model, okay? And so our, our goal is to learn D, because the, the, D is our representation. Now, notice there's nothing deep about this. This is a single scale because, well, there's nothing deep about this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to start out with something that most of you should be familiar with, and then we're going to move away, okay? But, but I think this is a, a good, this is a very straight, this is a <coughs> classical problem, okay? And a, another, another term for the statisticians in the world, in the room, and, 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 and by the way, feel free to ask questions at any time. This is just factor analysis. It's just factor analysis. Right? Yes. You're not assuming the weights are positive, or right? Not at this moment, oh. but I will in the later. Um, so Xi, that's a great question. I will later, okay. um, because the pixels are non-negative. That may be where you're going. Well, I don't know right. if you were thinking that, but but you're right. I mean, um, there, so, but um, but in any case, we're not going to do that. But I'll come back to that, and we will in a moment. It's a very good question, and, and please feel free to ask any questions. Okay, so. Um, this is, this is a, a classic problem. It's factor analysis, dictionary learning. This is a very, very widely studied problem, both in machine learning and statistics. So it's a good starting point. So how will we solve this problem? 
Okay, now, I come from Duke, and therefore I'm a Bayesian. Right? So I, uh, <laughs> that's an inside joke. Um, but uh, the Duke <laughs> Statistics Department, you're almost required to be Bayesian. Right? And that's, I think, uh, detrimental, but that's the way it is. Um, and, and so ultimately, I'm going to come at this from a Bayesian perspective just because I'm influenced by my neighbors. <coughs> but most, uh, you know, it's, it's funny. When you're at Duke, you think the whole world is Bayesian. You know, you walk around at Duke and you think everybody's Bayesian. And then you go to a conference and you get destroyed because most people are not Bayesian, right? And they don't even think in a Bayesian way. And they're, why are you being Bayesian, that type of thing. So I have learned through experience for being shot at to start out from a non-Bayesian perspective because it's the perspective that most people operate in. And it, it, it's, it's, and it has many, there are many reasons to do that. So let's, let's, so our goal here is to learn D, I'll call it D hat. I also want to learn these weights, W hat. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to solve an optimization problem. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, say that the, um, I want to learn D and W such that the L2 distance between XI and the data is as small as possible. Notice I've got an argmin out, out front here. So, um, so, um, uh, I want to. I want to. I want to fit the data. That's that's what that term says. But if I if I don't impose regularization, this is an ill-posed problem. In other words, I have a lot of data. N is large, but there are a lot of parameters here to be. Uh, for every for every I, for every sample x i, I have to estimate a k-dimensional real vector, and then moreover, I got to learn this dictionary. So there's a lot to learn here. And so if I don't regularize I'm going to be in trouble. So there's two regularizations. So one is an L2 norm on the kth column for all capital K columns of that dictionary. This is, this is called just L2 regularization. This is very basic stuff, ridge regression type of a thing. That's standard. The thing that um, was somewhat revolutionary uh, when, well, it's called lasso, so the statisticians know what I'm talking about. Um, is L1 regularization on, on the WI. L1 regularization means sparsity. It means that for every, so, so what, what, I'm, what this is saying is, let us learn D and W such that we fit the data. This term is actually not that important. It's just kind of, it just constrains the L2 norm of D, but nothing else. And then what this term is is really important because it says that the WI should be sparse. And so what that means is, is that each xi should only be represented in terms of a small subset of the columns of D. So we, this is a parsimonious, compact representation. What that means then is that D is typically overcomplete. The number of columns of D is typically larger than P. Yes? That is a great question. And that's why I'm Bayesian. <laughs> so, so an optimization person has to do um, cross-validation on those parameters and has to, and, and, and a Bayesian just hates that. And so um, what we're going to do later is make this in an, a Bayesian way and there'll be no tuning parameters at all. Okay? Yes? So if your K is larger than P, <coughs> that will mean like uh, uh, the things in the dictionary will contain the redundancy. So what you get are things like this. Um, they are redundant, but they are also descriptive. So I want to get features that are descriptive because I want to do subsequent inference like classification and other things. So to do that, instead of using, say, wavelets, which can represent anything, I want to learn dictionaries that are characteristic of the specific data under test. So this is, this is Barbara. This is a zoom in on Barbara one of the famous um, you know, pictures in, from image processing. These are, the diction these are um, four examples. We learn many more than four, but these are kind of nice. And, and what I'm showing you is, is the activation. So remember that, um, that this WI is sparse. And so then I can just make a map of where that guy has large value. And, you know, the thing we like about this is that, you know, this, is, um, this has high value right over here where it's matched up with her scarf. 
right? And then this, you know, has, has high value um, over here, et cetera, okay? Now, the thing, um, so I, I know I think I have a few um, compressive sensing people in the room. And um, one of the things, so I'm not going to really talk about this too much, but because of the fact that I'm imposing sparsity on the WI, this is actually a very parsimonious representation. And therefore, I don't actually even have to see all of the image to, to, um, to recover the dictionary. And then if I can recover the dictionary, so let me say this clearly. I do not need to see all of this image. If I can learn the dictionary based upon a small <coughs> fraction of this, then I should be able to impute the missing values. So what we did was we took... Um, 80% of the pixels in this image and removed them at random. And so this is a zoom up, zoom in, I think of just here, but of course we do it on the entire image. This is what we measured, we observed this. We then do dictionary learning on that, not this, that. And then we recover that, okay? So this is kind of magical. And we can do this in hyperspectral or whatever, but that's not the subject of today's talk. But um, you can do a lot with dictionary learning. Okay, so, um, but, you know, I really love that question about those lambda 1 and lambda 2 because um, this is the, the thing that people, most people, which means non-Bayesians, um, they, they don't like to talk about that too much because you've got to tune those parameters. You don't tune them right, you're in trouble. And, and so that's the Bayesian's reason, reason for living. So let's look at this guy. So I, I, I now I'm going to start to get more and more technical, but I... I know I got a lot of technical people in the room, so I, I, I feel fine. I uh, hope you feel fine. <laughs> so, uh, so this this is um, standard. This is um, this is virtually textbook at this you know today. So let's look at this from a Bayesian um, perspective. So what I'm going to tell you, and hopefully you can readily see, is that this and this are basically the same thing. I'm going to say that Xi is drawn Gaussian with a mean d times w with a precision alpha naught, that term right there is that term when I look at the log of the posterior. And so what I'm, gonna tell, what I'm saying to you is this is the map solution to that maximum a posteriori map. And so um, this is this. This is this. This is that. Because th this is, this is um, a Laplace prior. Notice the mag in there. That's L1 norm, sum of mags, right? So, um, so, so the, the point is, is that um, this is the same as that from the perspective of this is a map solution to a Bayesian setup. As a Bayesian, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a prior on alpha naught gamma prior, <coughs> and I'm going to put a prior on lambda, a gamma prior. Those are the lambda 1 and lambda 2, and I'm going to infer it, okay? The other thing um, that I, I want to point out to you is, is that from a Bayesian perspective, this is not necessarily a very fun thing to do, deal with because it's a non-conjugate prior. I'm getting more and more technical. I'm reaching fewer and fewer of you, but I, I want to reach as deeply as I can. This is a non-conjugate prior, so therefore it makes inference harder. So one of the kind of miracles that is, there's been a lot going on in machine learning. It's a, it's a very competitive field, and I think it brings the best out of us, although it's a challenging field to be in. But people are, are doing all kinds of things, and, and one of the things that people have recognized is that this hierarchical representation is the same as this. A, 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 uh, this is a, it's called a scaled mixture of normals with an inverse gamma, and uh, this is an offline discussion, but that is the same as that. And so the point is, is that when we actually do Bayesian inference, we do this, we do this, we do this, we do that, okay? The technical detail, but the point is, is that we can do this, and we can do it really well, and we can produce really pretty stunning, stunning results, okay? And we do this in, in, in um, uh, many many problems. <clears throat> okay, so let's, let's now start to move to a deep representation because there's nothing deep about, um, about what we're doing here, okay? So um, 
What we're going to um, do is develop a slightly different model. So Xi is going to be drawn the same way as, as we did before. Uh, D will be the same. What we're going to do is we're going to impose a different prior on, w, on WI. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to impose sparsity, but explicit sparsity. So, um, so the, the thing, again, um, I have some lasso experts in the room, I think, right? So, um, so this, this lasso is a, um, is a way of imposing sparsity, but the sparsity actually almost comes, I apologize, almost as a hack of a map solution that this prior is actually not a sparse prior. It only kind of comes as like just almost just like a hack. That it, um, it, this, the, the point is the map solution is sparse, but the, the, the model itself is not sparse. So if you look at the mode, it's actually not sparse. And, so, and, and theory tells you you want <coughs> the mode, not the, not the map. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to replace our prior on W. We're no longer going to use that lasso prior. We're going to use so-called spikes lab prior. Okay? Um, so we're going to say that um, WIK is the weight on the kth dictionary for data I. And we're going to represent this as the product of a binary variable and a real variable. VIK is, um, is either 0 or 1. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to do, uh, is this chalk or what do I do with this? <laughs> yeah, that'll work. You can write on it. Uh, on the, no, oh, on, the on, on here? On okay. the electronic. Right, right, very no, good. It's not going to work. Not going to work? No, because. You're on your computer. <laughs> Forget it. No problem. <laughs> BIK is in the set zero one. one That's all I wanted to say. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> and, and BIK is drawn Bernoulli, okay? So BIK is 0 or 1. If it's 0, if BIK is 0, that means that the ith data sample does not use the kth dictionary element. It's 1, it does use it. The ZIK is a, is a um, Gaussian, uh, is a drawn Gaussian. And so this is a so-called spikes lab. People, I, I, I'm sure a few people know what I'm talking about. Um, it has a spike at zero, and then it has a slab, a Gaussian slab away from zero. And so what this is doing is it, it's, ex, it's imposing explicit sparsity. And the way we do that is we're going to put um, we're going to put a prior on pi k. So pi pi k is the probability of whether the kth dictionary is used. And so this Indian buffet process, anybody heard that term? Indian buffet. I'm somebody must have, right? So in machine learning, there are all kinds of camps in, in the Bayesian camp, machine uh, this Indian buffet process. The way it works is, is like this. It's kind of nice. We have a data sample. Data sample is a customer. Data, the data sample goes to a restaurant. It's an Indian restaurant. And the reason it's an Indian restaurant is because, uh, is because Indian restaurants have oftentimes have many, many dishes. Each of the columns of D is a dish. And then the customer walks into the restaurant, walks up to each dish one by one. With probability pi k, they, they choose whether to take that dish or not. And then if they take it, they multiply it by, a, um, by this real number. So this is, a, this is called an Indian buffet process. But it, it explicitly imposes sparsity through the choice of A and B on this beta distribution. Again, th another way of calling this is it's a beta Bernoulli process. Beta Bernoulli process, and, and Michael Jordan at, at, uh, at Berkeley had a lot to do with the development of this. Okay? This imposes explicit sparsity. Everybody, are we good so far? All right, so now we're going deep. We're going about ready to launch into <laughs> deep, deep learning. Okay? So this is, this is like kind of basic standard Bayesian statistics. And, and what we're doing here is we're, we're saying that the probability with which the kth dish or dictionary is selected is pi k, and we're going to flip coin Bernoulli to determine whether we're going to use it or not. 
But, but why do we have to use a beta distribution? Maybe we could do something different. And this is the key, <laughs> this is the key, key thing, okay? All right, so this, this, is, this, is, this is it. This is one of the really key issues of, of deep learning. Exactly the same model. XI, dictionary, weight. WIK is the is, it tells us the strength imposed by the eighth, ith data on kth dictionary. It's explicitly sparse. The ZIK is exactly the same. BIK is again drawn Bernoulli. The difference is Instead of having a pi k, we're going to put a logistic function here. Sigma, sigma is the logistic function. That's, that's it. It's the key thing. But it allows, as you're going to see in a moment, it's going to allow us to do some things. And so, um, so the model is the same, but we're going to draw Bernoulli with the logistic. The logistic looks like this. And then for the kth dictionary, <coughs> element, we're going to draw that random variable um, in this way. Just dr draw it normally. Okay? Everybody, everybody hopefully is familiar with the logistic function, right? Um, so, um, so the way that we can look at this from a, um, from a statistical standpoint is that we draw these random variables, what, whatever that is, chi, 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 chi Chi, chi, psi 1, psi 2, psi k are drawn from a normal distribution. <coughs> they go into a logistic function. And then um, that logistic function then turns that into a probability. And then for the ith data sample, the bi1, bi2, bik tells us whether that, those um, dictionary elements are chosen or not. We multiply them by the real zik. Then we get the w's, wi1, wi2, wik. We multiply these guys by the dictionary d1, d2, dk, sum, xi. That's the generative model. So why are you choosing this logistic function? What's the rationale? Get to it in a second. But this is the key step. It's a good question. You'll see. The, the reason is, is that. Um, Okay, so this is a really great question, and it is, it is the question. So let's, let's try to understand this. this. This model, which is pretty standard, this beta distribution, I don't have a whole lot of things to play with. It's, it's just a beta distribution. But what goes into a logistic is a real number on the real line. So therefore, I can now... Instead of stopping the model, why not take that output and stick it itself into a logistic? In particular, like this. So what we're going to do is this. At the top, psi 1. Okay, now this is two-layer model, so this is superscript 2, layer 2. But I want to just show you that it's, it's a great, so let me, great question. Psi 1, psi 2, psi k 2, two I'm just going to say k. Subscript 2 means layer 2, okay? Um, exactly like I said before. Send them into a logistic. Now, Bernoulli, bi1, bi2, bik. Here's the key thing. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to take that dictionary, and that dictionary is no longer the dictionary that I showed you before. This is a dictionary that relates layer 1 to layer 2. I then take those weights, multiply it times the dictionary, and then that, those real numbers then go into the logistic at the layer below. And I can just keep on doing this as many layers as I want. So, so, that, so we can't do that with a beta distribution. That's the key. The logistic puts us on the real line. And once I'm on the real line, it's much easier to manipulate. This is deep learning. This is the sigmoid, this is called the sigmoid belief network. And this dates to 1995. They didn't view it this way. It was, it's actually, they, it was, I would say, kind of a hack, you know, uh, smart, it's a very smart hack. Very, I mean, in other words, let me say that carefully. <laughs> very, very um, insightful, um, very, very insightful, but not grounded in like basic statistics. 
And, um, and so what I wanted to do and what we've done this summer is to understand this from statistics in ways that we can feel comfortable with. Um, and, and we're going to see in a moment that when we understand it that way, using modern statistical methods, we can do inference on this in ways you could not do in 1995. So, so this, is, this is it. This is, this is uh, deep learning. Let me, let me say it again. I think I got a lot of nods, so I think I got it. But let me just say it again. Top layer, we're going to draw real numbers. Each of those real numbers goes into a sigmoid function which converts those real numbers to probabilities. And those are the probabilities with which that dictionary element will be used. Then the ith data sample draws a Bernoulli coin based upon the logistic output of each of these. That Bernoulli coin is then going to, those uh, um, binary variables are now going to weight a dictionary. Notice there's no real now. There's n it's all binary. They're going to um, multiply by a dictionary, which will relate layer one to layer two. Output is a real number, which then goes into a logistic at the next layer. And then the other thing is, is that at the next layer, we also have a bias. So, um, so what this is saying is, is that um, psi i k is um, what comes down from layer two to layer one. And then there's also an offset which is associated with, with each of these. So there's, there's two terms here. But in any case, that's the basic idea. And then um, this then goes into a logistic, out comes binary, multiply times the z, same way as before. Real value, dictionary, xi. This is a deep, this is a deep representation. And so we can do this as, um, for as many layers as we want. Okay, and so um, this, is, this is now for L layers. So that, that was for two layers. This is for L layers. So um, this is layer L to layer L minus 1. This is um, real, sigmoid, binary, dictionary, back into a sigmoid, binary, etc. And then when we get down to the bottom, um, we, we, uh, the, um, the binary units then feed into my dictionary at the, at the very bottom. Yes? So why more layers give you a better capability in terms of representing All right, great question. That's the key question. So if we go back to this model, each when the customer or the data goes to each of the dictionary elements or to each of the, um, the dishes at my buffet, they're going to flip a binary coin independently. The, the coin flips are independent. Okay? And, um, and moreover, secondly, the pi k is fixed. There's no, um, the, the, the pi k is just fixed. What, what happens is, is that in this, deep representation, okay, in the, in the deep representation, the, um, uh, the, the, the real values that feed into this the layer below, which through the sigmoid function define the probabilities, that real value is impacted by the binary variables on the layer above. And so the idea should be, the idea is that down near the data, we have primitive dictionary elements, very basic dictionary elements. And then what happens is as we go higher, we're going to, if I turn on a unit up high, so imagine I go, um, I go um, up here and I turn one unit on at layer L, all the rest zero. Then through the D, that, that's, that unit that is on is going to impact who is on beneath it and then who is on beneath it. And so what you're doing is, is that when you get down to the data level, which is built in terms of these primitive dictionary elements, they are impacted by more hierarchical or abstract um, concepts. So what we're going to do in the, concept, in the context of topic modeling is that down 
here, the dictionaries are going to be related to topics or word usage, you'll see in a moment. And um, up here, they're going to be like concepts. So, so it could be like politics. And then, so this unit being on means we're talking politics. And then, because we're talking politics, that means that certain units beneath it, like Barack Obama and Senate, and those units turn on. And then because Barack Obama turns on, then we expect something else to turn on. And so the idea is, is that up here, we're looking at abstract, fairly complicated concepts. And then they then propagate all the way down to the data, which is built in terms of primitives. So to, to give a, a sense of this, so I'm now, um, this is a bit unfair in the sense. <laughs> because it's, it's um, a bit misleading, because I'm now skipping ahead to, to convolutional, convolutional version. But the same idea holds. So what we're going to do is, we, in this analysis, we're going to look at images which happen to be faces. We're at, this is actually, well, these are faces, OK? At layer one, layer one, so uh, layer one is right at the data. Layer two is above that. Layer three is above that. And so what I, I want to do is I just first want to look at what do the layer one dictionary elements look like. And they look like Gabor elements. They look like rotated Gabor elements. And if you go look at the literature, it turns out there's a lot of evidence that this is how the mammalian visual system actually works. So the, um, this, this is actually very exciting. That, that you, and, and the way they do that is um, they shine things that look like this, like on an uh, on, uh, eye of, of a mammal under test. And they look at what neurons turn on, and it turns on that it turns out that very prim, very um, localized neurons turn on when these guys are put on the eye. Okay, but in any case, this is layer one. Layer two. This is you know th we we think this is pretty um, remarkable. <coughs> it's like an eye. Can you see that? It's an eye. Um, this is a database that has faces. It has cars. You notice it is tire an ear, et cetera. And then um, when you go to the third layer, higher level, you start to get things that look like a car or um, look like a face, right? So layer one, primitive. Layer two, one layer above, a little less primitive. In terms of building blocks, layer um, higher, these are um, rather abstract concepts. And the way that we're doing this is I'm doing exactly what I said. You, we go to the top layer, we turn on one unit, and we propagate it down to the data plane. And, and, and these are just statistical renderings through the, the generative process. So, so that's the motivation. Go ahead, question? Kind of follow-up question. So uh, I think it depends on the network setup. So in terms of like first layer, how many uh, nodes are there? Mm -hmm. So will the feature being extracted remain the same if I change that organization? So let's see, you know, in your example, you showcase some kind of like edges. Yes. But if I change it, I change, change the network what? structure. Change All right. Will so the this, feature change? So the thing is, is that, um, so related to that, so let's talk about how one would change the network. So um, in a deep model, so let me, let me just say it again, because I, I just want to make sure everybody's with me. Real values go in. They go into a logistic that turns into probabilities. We get a Bernoulli flip. We get binary. Binary goes through the dictionary, which yields a real value guy, which goes back into the sigmoid, which then goes back into Bernoulli, and this repeats, right? So one of the ways that I could change things is that K sub L is the number of units at layer L. K sub L minus 1 is the number of units at layer L minus 1, and K sub 1 is the number of units at layer 1. So those seem like kind of parameters, and, and maybe if I change K1, K2, and KL, I might get different results, right? That would be very unpleasant if that were the case. This is why I, this is why I like to do Bayesian things, because what we can do is we can put priors on these Xs and don't just draw them Gaussian. And then we can learn the number of units at each layer. And, and we do that. And the thing that is really beautiful, and we think, is that so we, we have a, a, a model where we, we learn the number of units at each layer. 
you would, we would expect, you, maybe hopefully you would agree, that near the bottom we would have a lot of basic primitive building blocks, very basic prim building blocks. But then when I look at a certain class of data, the number of abstract concepts that I might consider might not be that large. Right? Like if you look at so-called the News Group 20 database, this is a document, there's 20 types of classes of the Reuters news, right? There's 20 concepts. But so what we learn is that as we go higher in our hierarchy, the number of units is actually smaller. So, so, and we learn, we learn the network. So, um, but the, the other answer is the, um, it's not that sensitive. You, you, it, it's, it's, it's actually not that sensitive. Yes? If you can actually get as many concepts and number of wires, you just keep on adding on wires until you hit one or zero. Yeah, that's a great question. So that's basically, we won't go to one or two, but actually sometimes we will. So like, um, so, so uh, Hinton has a kind of a famous paper that was published in Science where he took documents and he kept on going up until he had two units at the top. And then what he did was he um, took documents, a corpus, and he represented each document by the probability of the units at the very top. So this is a two-dimensional vector. This is a two-dimensional. It's, it's just a two-dimensional. It's it's um, it's it's uh, the, the probability that comes out of that logistic, right? And so each document is just a two-dimensional probability vector. And he he showed the corpus in that space, and it was absolutely beautiful the way it um, it turned out, right? So. Um, so yeah, that typically you'll go high enough until the, at the top it's pretty parsimonious representation. I can see when you show the, the higher level things, you've got distance from the raw data right. and you've got complexity in the concept, but why do you call either of those abstract? So, so the thing is, is that at the top, by the way, these are simply words. Yeah, yeah, no, no, you know no, what I mean? I, I, so I, like when we use words like I, I actually, this is one of the problems with the literature. Okay. Is that they use words like that, and I don't know what they're talking about. Okay. You right, know what that's, I mean? That's fine. And, but, but so let's talk concretely. Cause, so when you turn on one of these units, and let's say all the rest are off, one is on, then then through this dictionary, which relates layer L minus 1 to layer L, the presence of that being on is going to dictate that some of those sides are going to be large and positive, which implies, through the logistic function, that there is an associated high probability of those being used. And then the fact that those have a high probability of being used is going to impact down below. And so the point is, is that one unit on, only one unit on at the top implies many units on at the bottom. And so the idea is, is that towards the bottom, these are primitive building blocks. And the usage of those primitive building blocks is dictated by what is on at the top. If we wish to call that, that this is kind of an abstract concept, use that language. This is mathematics. And, and the mathematics says that when this is on and all the rest are off, it dictates that there are going to be certain ones that are going to have high probability of being on at the bottom. We shouldn't put any more words to it than that. That's what the math does. Any other? Yes? Can we train this? Great question. We'll get to that. <laughs> all right. Very good question. How do you train these? So, so you know the, the thing that's really interesting to a machine learning person is that um, you ask yourself, you know, I would ask myself, like, was all the stuff done in 1995, like, useless? Like, um, did, like, in, in year 2015, um, are we, like, so advanced that all of the stuff that was done in 1995 was just kind of silly stuff? And... Um, the answer is no, because you can go read the paper by Radford Neal on this basic model from 1992. So what has changed? What has changed is our ability to do training and learning. Because if you look at this model, there's a lot of parameters in that model. 
And in 1995, we did not have computer horsepower, and we did not have a lot of data. Now we have a lot of computer horsepower, and we got a lot of data. That's one of the big, big things. So the, the point is, Radford Neal and J Jeff Hinton, these were really smart guys. They, they had some really, really good ideas. They were probably two decades ahead of their time. But they're still around, and now it is their time, right? And um, so the key, the key insight is, is the following, okay? If I take this model with L layers, and L could be six or seven layers, and I look at the number of parameters if I, I have to learn, if I just throw data at that, <laughs> good luck, right? Because you can imagine there are all kinds of local modes and everything, right? But the thing is, is that this is actually um, just kind of a repeated architecture. So how about if what we do is we start at the data, and let's just build the first layer. Let's just build one layer model. And then what I'm going to do is when I get that one layer model, I'm going to get, um, so in goes a real value, a real vector. I'm going to learn one layer, just one layer. And then what I'm going to learn through my inference, which I'll get into a little bit more in a moment, is I'm going to learn the probability that each of those units are on. That's, that's what I'm going to learn. So it's a number between 0 and 1. I'm now going to use those probabilities as the input to the next layer. And then I'll do it again. I'm going to learn one layer at a time by stacking it up. And then once I get to the top, I have a very good initialization then I'm going to run the whole model at that point and just kind of shake it up, refine it. So what this is called is pre-training, stacking, stacked pre-training, one layer at a time. And then that gives you a very good initialization, and then you run the whole model, and that's called refinement. And, and what it does, it just kind of wiggles around a little bit. It makes it a little better, but actually it's important. But um, that was not around 1995. That was that, so kind of obvious, maybe, um, but um, people didn't do it. It was done in 2006 for the first time. And um, so, when do you know it's enough? Enough what layers? Yeah. For how much data you have and how much? Uh, you mean training uh, what, uh, what? What? What am I asking? Is enough? In other words, that, that you know that uh, you can, you have somewhat conversion to a good model. So. Um, uh, well, well, okay, let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so here, here um, are some results where we're um, uh, doing uh, model fitting on the Caltech 101 data. And I'm going to use an algorithm which I'll talk about in a moment, which is an iterative algorithm. So this is the number of iterations. I'm going to learn the first layer. And now it, it pretty much converges. Now. With that, I'm going to stack on another layer. And now this is looking at essentially the model fit, okay, the L2 <coughs> term. And then cranks up a lot. Second layer adds a lot. Third layer, not so much. So at that point, we would pretty much say we got to come. That's, that's, that's enough. But we can, we, can watch, we can watch the jump in the data fit as we, as we move up the, up the hierarchy. This is for a class of images. This is right? for a class of images. And how many images do you need to? So, to so, uh, so it's interesting. Um, so let's go back to um, to this this problem, which which I started with because it's something we all we all think we're comfortable with. So let's ask. Let's forget the sigmoid belief network. How many samples do I need to solve that problem? The answer to that question is not solved. We don't have an answer to that question. In other words, one layer dictionary learning, smartest guys, you know, I'm not a really, a th I'm, I do some theory, but I, I, that's not my so main thing. Best theoretical people in the world, they don't answer, they can't answer that question. So the point is, if you, if you think about some of the research questions, we don't even know how big N has to be to solve that problem. And let alone something like like this. 
So, 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 uh, Hamid, it's a great question. We don't have an answer. But you know, it's it's, it's interesting. So, um, so Jan LeCun, a good a friend of mine, and he was here a couple of years ago. So, you know, you get into these like kind of like arguments. Ac we know academicians we like to fight with each other, and um, so people will ask that question, and then you'll get people uh, the, the question, which is a good question, which is how many samples do you need to learn that well? And how do you know you don't have local optimal and whatnot? And then you'll, you'll have some theoretical guys in the back saying, that's the problem we're solving. We're working on that problem. And then and we're working strenuously. And these are very smart mathematicians. And then you ask them, well, what answers do you have? Not too many right now, but we're working on it. And so Jan, he was in one of these types of things. And, and, and Jan said to them, he said, look, you guys work on that. Um, best of luck to you. Right now, I'm solving real problems. I'm working on real things. And, and when you guys have an answer to that question, you let me know. But right now, I'm, I'm working on real things. So um, it's a good question. Um, the, the, the truth is, is that these models work really well. And, um, and, and, and that was you know, part of you know, I mean, this, my summer, summer of deep learning um, was about trying to understand, was it, was it something that magical that Jeff Hinton and only Jeff Hinton could do? Um, and, um, and, and I can tell you that's absolutely not the case because my students have, have done it and starting from nothing as far as knowledge base. So, um, all right, so let me, um, all right, so just to quickly, this is maybe before I dive, see that painful thing I have in front of you? So I thought I'd better show you something nice. So, um, <laughs> so you can also do imputation with this. So remember I told you we could do imputation? So these are um, the digits. This is the so-called MNIST data. Um, probably the most overstudied database in the world. That's an inside joke for some of you. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to learn my model using digits other than these digits. I'm going to show it this and ask it to tell me what it thinks it is. And, and that is here. So, you know, we purposely didn't want to make it perfect, um, but it's actually pretty, pretty darn good. If you, if you look at like, like this, we're wrong. We get it wrong. It's a zero. But if I only showed you that, It'd be, I don't know if you would predict that. So, um, so actually, it works, it works really well. Um, it's really good at doing imputation. But if you take the fourth, uh, the, the fourth item, mm -hmm. even as a human, I can tell you that it's either an eighth or a ninth. Right? The fourth one? Yeah, the fourth one. Right, 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 right. So, so what? So I think... <laughs> I think we did good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think we did well. Well, that, that, no, that, that just says that something is, is, is fishy. No, what? What are we looking at? We're looking at that one? Right. So you said it's either eight no, or nine. No, but you, you're, you're looking only at the... Uh, no, no, no. But you, you said you looked at that and you told me that was an eight or a nine. Yeah? Right. Yeah. So did we. We said it was a nine. <laughs> no, no, but as a human, I can, I can, either, I can either interpret it as an eight or a nine. I, I, this, this is where I get confused, where, where basically how the machine can, if I, as a human I cannot tell, how the machine can tell from, from that little data. All right, so what did we do? You know, what, what did we do? That's a great question. So what we do is this. We take the data we have available to us, which is not all the data. We then build this hierarchy. And then... Um, at the top layer, it tells us which units are on that are consistent with what we, um, what we see, right? Then, this is a generative model. So then, I then generate data statistically. So the thing is, I'm only showing you one run. So in fact, I might get an eight or nine. So, this, so what we're doing, this, I take this, I then go up the tree, up my model, and then... Um, I learn what is on at the top, and then I propagate that down, all the way down to the data plane, including where the data is not. And that is one instantiation. I, I didn't do it, but if we ran it multiple times, we might indeed get an eight. But, but the other aspect of this is that if you, if you have that at the top, which a lot of people do with the MNIST data, if you have 10, 10 nodes at the top, output nodes for those, then they'll have basically, with the logistic, you'll have a posterior probability of each one of those That's 10 right. numbers. That's so right. in that case, what they normally do is they call a soft max, which they say, just give me the one that has the highest probability. But the model itself would also 
probably have a high probability for both eight and nine. In that case, there's more probability for the other. Totally person. right. And um, and the difference between so what you could do is just take this and stick it into a soft Mac logistic thing, and then and they would probably tell you eight or nine. The key thing is this is a generative model. It will generate the data. So to build a classifier that says is it an eight or nine, that's fine. You could do that. We're doing something else. We are imputing the missing data. So a logistic classifier, softmax, is not going to do that for you. So, um, but but yes, and, and and Hamid, I guarantee you that if we put this through a softmax, it's going to be eight or nine. It's going to tell us that. We, in fact, so how do we do? Actually, um, good question. So, let me before I show you all these uh, terrible results. I mean, I mean, sorry. I, once I, sh I before I show you some more math. How do we do on that in, on that classification problem? So um, this is the test error on the MNIST problem. Um, this is our result. So we get 99.58% um, accuracy. How does that do relative to the state of the art? It is basically the state of the art. The, there, these other methods are kind of whatever. But if you look at that, it's, it's, it's very good. So listen, um, this was my first attempt at this talk, <laughs> and so I have learned that, that I can I could only go two two layers. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have done this to topics and, and to uh, uh, and, and to documents, um, but so um, so let me let me um, just kind of summarize. So um, so the the key thing that particularly for the you know the statistically and mathematically minded people. Um, what we what we have done is is to demonstrate that this thing called a sigmoid belief network and the restricted Boltzmann machine is intimately related to this um, is nothing more than a sequence of um, of of of, of uh, real logistic binary real logistic binary that you can constitute in a principled generative model and using modern Bayesian techniques, so I'll just let you look at this. So there's, there's some important mathematics. So I, I'm not even going to try to explain this. So important mathematics that allows us to do this today. So we could do this. We could do this very fast, and we can get really state-of-the-art results. So the, the results that we get are as good as any in the world. Right. So um, so it's 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 really exciting. I think it's an exciting field. Um, there's a lot to be done, um, but it's also very exciting. So. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I think I'll stop. So thank you for your attention. Yeah. Uh, so do you have anything published or anything available about the deep topic modeling? I'd be very interested in seeing what you got to on. Yeah, so that's actually going to ICML. And uh, so we, I, I can send you some stuff, but we haven't written it up yet. That's going to ICML. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm afraid I don't have any, uh, we don't have any time for questions, so let's thank our speaker again. <laughs>